I've delivered this seminar now to 1,600 people live on stage, and I'm going to share it with you. This is the ultimate answer to the debate between veganism versus carnivore, meat eating versus plant eating, and ultimately it comes down to knowing the science. So let's get into this. My name is Dr. Darren Schmidt. I've been studying and practicing hardcore holistic nutrition since 1993. I quit taking insurance November 1st of 2005, and that demands that I create an environment where People actually get better in my clinic. They have to get better because people pay cash to see me. This is my bias. I've been low carb since 1999 when I went to a, a meeting by the Weston A. Price Foundation. I run the nation's largest non-insurance nutrition clinic in the country, 60,000 patient visits in the last five years. And I post videos on TikTok and YouTube, I offer sell online courses and eBooks. This is my diet history. Since 1999, I've been low carb meaning less than 75 grams of carbs a day. And I've been very strict about that. And in 2015, I started cycling in and out of ketosis. In 2018, I started the carnivore diet, August 2018. And I did so well on that. Then in 2019, I decided to eat as much meat as I possibly could every single day. And it was great. And I was going to the gym twice a week. I put on some weight. I felt fantastic. But then my clothes got too small, so I had to go to my second rule, which was eat as much meat as I need or want for the day. And that includes more leaner meat, whereas before that it was more fattier meat. And I've talked three times to the USDA Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee to try to convince them that they need to look at only science for the 2020 and 2025 food pyramid update. And I have failed. And right now in uh, the year 2024, they're continuing to advise on what uh, the next food pyramid should look like. And it's going to be a total failure. And they're replacing me with Beyond Burger and Impossible Burgers because their opinion leader is Dr. Christopher Gardner. And he's from Stanford. He's a vegan since 1983. His labs are funded by Impossible and Beyond Burger fake meat. So in order to know what science is and to how to read science, you have to know the levels of evidence. So at the very top, we have level one, systemic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials clinical guidelines based on systemic reviews or meta-analysis. Okay, let's start at the bottom, level seven, expert opinion. That's the beginning of science. It's not science. It's the beginning. There's many steps. Level six, single descriptive or qualitative study. There's no science there. Level five, systemic review of descriptive and qualitative studies. And if you don't understand what this is meaning, I'll get more into it with future slides coming up pretty quick. Level four, case control or cohort study. The word cohort means group, studying one group of people. Level three is controlled trial. Now we're getting into science where you actually do a trial. You do an experiment where you're testing something on a group of people and you have a second group, which is a control group. So you need two groups of people in order to do science. So level seven, six, five, four are not science because there's only one group and there's no control group. Level two is one or more randomized controlled trials which is similar to a controlled trial, only it's randomized, so the people in the different groups are random. And then let's go to the next slide. So this is the same information, just uh, labeled differently on this pyramid. So the very bottom, we have editorials and expert opinions. Above that, we have case series and case reports, so in single individual patients getting better. Above that, case control studies, and then above that, cohort studies. Remember, cohort just means group. Again, this is not science. They're just looking at a group of people and how they're doing and what their diet is and what their LDL cholesterol is, but there's no experiment. You don't do an experiment until you do a trial, a randomized controlled trial, and then systemic reviews of trials only. This is another period, same information, just bear with me. You're going to be an expert at this, and nobody can ever sway you into believing that meat is bad or plants are good after you know how to read science. Okay, at the very bottom, we have expert opinions. And at the very top, we have randomized control trials. Notice on the far right, at the very top, it says it is shown that. So when you have randomized control trials, you have fact. And you can say things like, it is shown that, or it is a fact that. Okay, right below that, it says controlled longitudinal studies. That is not science. They're just tracking a group of people over time. And they do a series of measurements or surveys, um, like once a year, once every five years. And from that, you can say, it is likely that. Okay, and then over here we have, there are signs that, if you can see my cursor on the right, these are two types of 
studies that are not scientific and they're studying a group of people and then at the very bottom extra expert opinions. So notice on the left here, it says studies reviewed by IARC. IARC stands for International Association of Research on Cancer. This is a group of people who have convinced the World Health Organization that uh, meat is cancerous. So the WHO has classified meat as a class two carcinogen. But the studies that this IARC people group of people did were not science. They only looked at this uncontrolled longitudinal studies and then cross-sectional studies and case studies. They did not look at controlled longitudinal studies or randomized control trials. So based on opinion and based on non-scientific data, they've convinced the World Health Organization that meat is cancerous. Okay, total BS. So when you do a survey or when you're following a group of people over the course of time and you look at their diet and you look at their LDL cholesterol and you see how healthy they are or not, what happens is there's two groups of people that shake out and they're called adherers versus non-adherers. Adherers obey their MD. They have healthy lifestyle choices and they live longer. They eat beans, they exercise, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they wear their seatbelts when they drive their car and they drink plenty of water, they're usually thin. And then non-adherers have poor lifestyle choices. They smoke, they drink, they eat red meat and they are more overweight and they don't live as long. Does that mean that red meat is bad? Does that mean that eating beans is good? No, there's too many variables. That's the problem with any study that does not have a control group. That's the problem with any study that is not actually scientific experimentation. So when you have epidemiology, there are spectacular failures where the government or some governing body has created some policy based on these surveys, this observational studies, uh, epidemiology. And there were no scientific studies, but yet they still made policies based on opinion or based on surveys. And these were later reversed once a controlled trial was actually done or a clinical trial was done. So this idea that antioxidant vitamins are healthy, that was scientifically tested. And guess what? They're not healthy. Antioxidants are anti-oxygen. And as a human being, raise your hand if you're a human being, you need oxygen in your body. Why would you take a pill that is anti-oxygen? Limitations of cholesterol in the diet. Back in the 80s, it was declared that cholesterol in your diet raises your cholesterol and therefore causes heart disease. And then later in experimentation, they found out that cholesterol in your diet does not raise your cholesterol in your blood. Uh, the cap on cholesterol in your diet was stopped in 2015 by the USDA Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. I'm going to jump down here to the last one. Hormone replacement therapy is safe. There's a study done with the Women's Health Initiative 15, 20 years ago, and they saw that women taking synthetic estrogen and progesterone had a much higher rate of cancer. They had to stop that part of that trial early. Another example would be, you may have heard that when babies are exposed to Beethoven and Mozart music, then they became smarter. Well, that was an observation, but once it was actually tested, it was discovered that smart people tend to listen to more Mozart and Beethoven and they give birth to smart babies. Had nothing to do with what music they were listening to. That's just another example. Let me introduce you to this guy, Dr. John Yonides from Greece. He's an MD, meta-researcher, mathematician. And he says nutritional epidemiology is a scandal. It should just go to the waste bin. And the study that he um, is pertaining to is this called Most Research Findings Are False for Most Research Designs and for Most Fields. So in this study, he's actually looking at different types of science, including economics, biology, environmental science, space science, material science, and also pharmacology, biomedical. And he says nutritional epidemiology is a scandal and it should just go to the waste bin. And uh, vegans and vegetarians hate this guy. As a matter of fact, Dr. Christopher Gardner, the guy that I mentioned before, I emailed him and I said, hey, but John Unides says this about science. And Christopher Gardner says, I don't like John Unides. He said that in an email to me directly. Both of these men are in Stanford. But like I said, if you're a vegan vegetarian, you're not going to like this guy. You're not going to read his math. You're not going to study his math. You're not going to want to know what his math says because it goes against what vegans post as science. Here's John Unides also quoting about this diet called the Eat Lancet diet, 
which was released in 2019 on the Lancet Medical Journal. And it says a very small amount of meat is all we need as human beings, like two ounces per week or two ounces per day. I forgot how much, but not very much. And John says the health claims in the Eat Lancet diet are a science fiction. I can't call it anything else. So let's look at the math. Yonides comparing re randomized control trials versus epidemiology. So there's a statistic about finding truth and another one about finding the disease. So to find truth, it's a ratio. So a quality randomized control trial or actual science scientific experiment has a one-to-one -one or two-to-one -to -one chance of finding truth, depending on the type of RCT. Epidemiology has a one to 10 or all the way down to one to a thousand chance of finding truth because epidemiology is a fancy survey. Now finding the disease is called PPV, positive predictive value. Ideally, you want that greater than 0 0.5. And with a quality randomized control trial, it's, eight, it's 0.85, which is fantastic. Epidemiology has a PPV of 0 0.0015 up to 0 0.2. And this is the study, and this is the page of the study that I'm referring to, and you can look this up on PubMed. These next four slides are called surveys are not science. So there needs to be an experiment where you do something to a group of people to cross the threshold from survey to science. So you have researchers doing surveys, and then you get um, some statistics from that. And if the statistics are good, you send that to other research that actually do science. So it's a process. These survey studies are not science. Cohort, longitudinal study, cross-sectional study, case study, case series, case control studies, observational studies, epidemiology, exploratory epidemiology, and meta-analysis of these surveys. These surveys are science right here. Controlled clinical trial, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and systemic review of only controlled trials. That's it. There's no more. There are only these uh, types of science that are actually science. Okay, these are labels. These are actual types of surveys that are passed off as science all over social media, all over the internet, all over university um, lecture halls. These surveys are not science. Blue Zones, China Study, Epic Study, NHANES, Okinawan, Seventh-day Adventist, and the Ansel Keys Seven Country Study. Now, with Ansel Keys, there's some vehement defense of that study because they measured the food, they weighed the food, and they track the people and, and how well they're doing with their health. But yet, they didn't have an experimental group and a control group. It was still a longitudinal cohort survey type study. It wasn't an experiment. These surveys are science. Verta Health study. Verta Health was two years keto, 265 patients, I believe. They had a 74% retention rate over seven, over the two years. It's amazing. I'll get into that more. The Women's Health Initiative, I already mentioned before because they did, part of that was on the hormones. Another part was where they took a group of women and they said, decrease your meat intake by 20%. And they tracked them over years and they compared that to other women in the group or in a separate group. And they said, don't decrease your meat intake. And you would expect the people that decrease their meat intake by 20% would drop their heart disease, cancer, diabetes, et cetera, by 20% over the course of five years, and that didn't happen. So that trial proves that meat does not cause these diseases. I have more trials coming up to say the same thing. This next bullet point says there are 1,910 low-carb clinical trials. All of them are ignored by the USDA Dietary Guidelines Committee. 1,910 trials ignored. Okay, next bullet point, low carb beats low fat 94 to 7 in randomized control trials. This website right here, PHCUK stands for Public Health Collaboration of the UK. They're like the goal uh, keepers. They're keeping track of the competition between low carb versus low fat. And low carb is beating up low fat so badly 94 to 7. Let's talk about how unethical diet experts talk. This first bullet point says, you need to look at the totality or preponderance of the science. And what they're saying is that all science or all studies are equal. And it's not true. Only 5% of nutrition studies are actual science. 95% are a fancy survey. 
click trials on top left corner of PubMed to weed out the non-science. So we're going to research some kind of a nutrition diet question on PubMed. In the upper left corner, click on clinical trial and randomized control trial. And that weeds out 95% of the, of, the of the articles, which are just surveys, which are garbage. Okay, so make sure you do that so you know what science actually is. Unethical diet experts often claim eating five almonds a day makes you let live 11 years longer. This is not plausible. This doesn't happen. A single nutritional chemical causes disease, such as TMAO, ApoB, nitrosamines, LDL. Not plausible that a single nutritional factor in the body causes disease. Harvard School of Public Health Diet Survey, okay, it's not scientific. It's been studied. This was invented by Dr. Walter Willett at Harvard. It is not scientifically valid. The American Heart Association, American Medical Association, USDA, uh, the American Dietetics Association, Diabetic Association, they all promote a vegetarian vegan diet. This is an appeal to authority. Is it possible that these groups are wrong? Yes. Yes, it is possible that every single one of those people involved with these groups across all the governments of all the modernized Western world, can they all be wrong? Yes, 100%. In this trial, the Mediterranean diet is better than the standard American diet. Therefore, it is the best diet. This is a quote that unethical diet experts often claim, and they'll name a trial, they'll name a survey, they'll name science, and they'll say, we compare the vegetarian diet to the standard American diet, and we found that the vegetarian diet is better. Therefore, it's the best diet. That is not a true statement. Also, I've heard people say that the Mediterranean diet is the most well-researched and most well-studied diet in the history of nutrition. That's a true statement, but it's, it's worthless. That statement means nothing. The truth is that the ketosis was studied in 1921 and 1925 for epilepsy. It was studied in 1976 for athletes, for endurance. And regarding ketosis for diabetes and overweight, that wasn't started until 2005. It's a new uh, field of study, ketosis. But, but when you look at ketosis versus Mediterranean diet, ketosis wins. So just because the Mediterranean diet is old and well-studied doesn't mean it's the best. I hear this argument all the time. The Mediterranean diet, is cardiologists say it. Weight loss, obesity experts say it. The weight loss surgeons say it. Um, all the foodies, the vegans, the Mediterranean diet is the most well-studied. So what? Who cares? Doesn't matter. So let's go over what is the scientific process. Science is not a paper. It's a series of steps. All the steps must be followed. So we're going to go over four slides describing the different examples of the scientific process. So here we start with observation, and it goes to question hypothesis. The hypothesis is what you get after you do a survey, and then you do an experiment. This is the key. And after you do the experiment, you analyze and you make a conclusion. So this graphic is correct. Here's another one, identify the problem, gather data, get a hypothesis, then you test it with an experiment. This is correct. Does the new data agree, yes or no? You continue with your scientific process. This is the best graphic right here, ask a question, do background research, construct a hypothesis. Then you test it by doing an experiment, analyze the data, draw a conclusion, report the results, and the next step is that other clinics or other doctors, they do the trial again to see if they get the same result. So again, here, this is correct. It does an experiment. I pulled this one from Wikimedia, and there's no experiment in this one. It says, ask a question, form a hypothesis, collect data. Does the data reject the hypothesis? So Wikimedia, Wikipedia, they think that this is a scientific process. It they labeled it this way. It is not the scientific process. And I remember learning the scientific process in grade school. I, I learned it in grade school. And I think probably maybe every scientist, medical doctor, researcher, nutritionist, dietitian, professor, they probably all learned it in grade school. But I think by the time you get to college, you're supposed to forget it. And that's why we have such a mess that we do with our nutrition status in our country. All right, let's talk about reading these surveys. Okay, these are, this is not about science, it's about reading surveys. And there's what happens is you take a survey, say, how's your health and how's your diet? Maybe draw some blood, look at some numbers. 
and you put all this together on Excel and you do some fancy math and you come up with a number and that number is centered around one. And the number is called the relative risk up here on the upper left, or it's called the odds ratio, or it's called the hazard ratio. Okay, one is neither harmful nor beneficial. So let's say I want to, I have this idea that when people chew gum, they fall down more. That's my idea. And we take a survey on this. Okay, do you chew gum? How often? And do you walk? And do you fall down when you walk? And you do this survey, you, you collect 100,000 answers, and then you do this fancy math on Excel, and you come up with the number 1.0. So what that means is chewing gum does not benefit your walking, and it does not prevent you from falling down. It's neither harmful nor beneficial. But let's say that number is 0.8, so it's below one. That means that chewing gum protects you from falling down. And if the number is above one, let's say it's three, then that means that chewing gum makes you fall down more. So it must be it might be harmful, but you don't know until you run an experiment. This is the key. There's so many people who they get that number, you know, 1.5. Ooh, it's bad. Red meat has a hazard ratio of 1.1. Ooh, it's bad. No, that doesn't prove anything. What it means is if you want to test that hypothesis, you send it to other researchers that have a higher IQ, they have more money, more manpower, bigger computers, and they do a, an experiment which takes more time and effort. Just doing a survey is easy. You send out emails and you collect the data back by email. Any masters in nutrition can do that. Okay, now the key here is that if that number is above one, it's got to be greater than three or four and then you can send that hypothesis up to the researchers. Now, the relative risk on cigarettes is over 100. So vegans will say, well, bacon is as dangerous as cigarettes. No, the relative risk on bacon, is, it's as high as 10, but the relative risk on cigarettes is 100, 110, 120, 150. Those are two different sciences or surveys, I should say, Remember, John Unidi said nutritional epidemiology belongs in the waste bin. He did not say cigarette epidemiology belongs in the waste bin or any other type of epidemiology. He said nutritional epidemiology. When you study like the spread of typhus, for example, some sort of a virulent bug that's you know going across the landscape and affecting all these people, that's you know a different kind of epidemiology. And even that can be uh, very questionable as we discovered in 2020 and 2021. But we got to make sure that we're talking about nutritional surveys versus cigarette surveys versus other types of surveys. All right, now let me ask this question. Does eating plants affect cancer? Well, every single dot here is a survey. And when you here's the number one right in the middle. And then you have below one is beneficial and above one is potentially harmful to be discovered later by an experiment. But when you do all the math on all these surveys, the relative risk on all these foods is 0 0.998. So it's basically one. So the, when you compile all this together, do these foods affect cancer? And it includes salt, potatoes, pork, onions, olives, milk, lemon, eggs, corn. It's sugars in there, butter, bread, beef, wine is in there. So no, the answer is no. You can't say that these foods as a collective cause cancer. What causes cancer? Well, I'm going to I'm going to throw this out at you right now. Parasites, mold, bacteria, and I think lack of ketosis. Those are the four main aspects of causing cancer. Does protein intake affect cancer and heart disease? And the answer is no. With this reference right here, the relative risk for protein is 0 0.98 affecting cancer, and the relative risk for protein affecting heart disease is 0 0.99, so basically one. This includes plant and animal protein. And as I make this uh, video, just like two weeks ago, there was a study that came out that says, oh, protein causes heart disease. No, it does not cause heart disease. That was a survey, and there's no science there, so just ignore that. Now this slide says, does red meat cause cancer or heart disease? 
And no, we're not talking about protein. We're not talking about fat. We're talking about red meat as a food. And this says scientific clinical experiments say no. The effect of lower versus higher red meat intake on cardiometabolic and cancer outcomes, a systemic review of randomized trials. This is the best of the science. This is randomized trials. This is a review of only randomized trials. And this says that there are no scientific clinical experiments that show, that prove this hypothesis that red meat causes cancer or heart disease. And this is another one. This is surveys. Reduction of red and processed meat intake and cancer mortality in incidence. A systemic review and meta-analysis of cohort studies. So those are surveys. The possible absolute effects of red and processed meat consumption on cancer mortality and incidence are very small. And the certainty of evidence is low to very low. So therefore, in red at the very bottom, there are zero scientific experiments that show meat causes any disease. Now, the next slide says, does saturated fat cause disease? 67,000 men and women in randomized controlled trials on saturated fats lasting one to eight years, no effect on myocardial infarction, stroke, coronary heart disease, and coronary heart disease mortality. No effect on saturated fat. I see all the time cardiologists and other types of medical doctors are saying saturated fat causes heart disease, LDL causes heart disease, Red meat causes heart disease. No, it's not. I just debunked all of that with these few handfuls of slides. There is no robust evidence that current population-wide arbitrary upper limits on saturated fat consumption in the United States will prevent coronary vascular disease or reduce, reduce mortality. That's from this study right here. Does cholesterol in your diet cause disease? I already mentioned this. The answer is no. USDA Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee found no relationship of eating cholesterol and the cholesterol in your blood. Therefore, they removed the cap on cholesterol consumption in 2015. It was first postulated by the American Heart Association in 1961 based on observational studies. Remember, at that time, Harvard was being bribed by the sugar producers to say that fat causes heart disease and not sugar. That was the 1960s. That's such a huge blemish on Harvard, it's it's a, such a shame, and they they can't live that down. Low carbers, keto people like myself, we bring it up all the time about how they've been swayed. Harvard has been swayed, and our whole culture on nutrition has been anti-fat instead of anti-sugar. Okay, this is a video of Dr. Georgie Ede, and speaking of Harvard, she's at Harvard. So some good and bad comes from Harvard. She is a psychiatrist. She works at the clinic, so she sees 19 and 20-year-old Harvard students, they come in crying, they're depressed. She says, what's your diet like? Oh, you're eating tofu and beans? How about if you eat some steaks and burgers? And then they feel better. This is where she talks about a search she did on PubMed on vegetables and health. Here we go. Just as an experiment, I wanted to, to get a feel for what kinds of evidence is out there supporting vegetables and health. And so what I did was I went on PubMed, and which is a search engine for those of you who don't know, the percentage of cardinals. And um, uh, there are over 80,000 studies about vegetables, so I obviously couldn't go through all of those. Uh, narrowed them down to, to uh, randomized controlled studies having to do with vegetables and health. And I used the word health because if anything, that might induce a positive bias. It's looking for evidence to support vegetables. And so unfortunately, most of these studies I, I had to eliminate uh, from, from the consideration because most of them were irrelevant to the question. The vast majority of studies about vegetables were about how to get people to eat more of them, not about whether or not they were actually healthy. So, and of the studies that remained, 18 of them were negative. The investigators were looking for health benefits from vegetables and didn't find what they were hoping to see. And as you might notice here, uh, the, another problem with vegetable studies is that the vast majority of vegetable studies are not studies of vegetables. They're studies of fruits and vegetables. And fruits and vegetables are very different uh, from a plant point of view and from our point of view. They're, they're just completely different creatures. So hard to say. So in the positive studies, I found 10 positive studies but unfortunately, none of them control for refined carbohydrates. It's very hard to say whether or not the health benefits that the investigators claimed were due to the vegetables 
were due to the vegetables or whether they were due to the fact that the people who were eating more fruits and vegetables were eating less refined carbohydrate. And 10 other positive studies, unfortunately, manipulated more than one variable. So they didn't just add more vegetables to people's diets. They also happened to reduce sodium or reduce saturated fat or um, add exercise, et cetera. So it's just hard to tell which part of the diet was, or, or the intervention was responsible for the health benefit. I'm not saying that the vegetables couldn't have been responsible because they could have been, we just can't tell because of the way the studies were designed. So that was 2012 when she made that lecture. And she's saying that there are zero scientific studies that prove that vegetables are good for our human bodies. I emailed her recently and I said, hey, did you update this information? And she said, yes, in 2017, she made the same study, the same search on uh, PubMed. And again, there are zero scientific clinical experiments to prove this idea that vegetables are good for us. So if you have somebody set, telling you to eat your vegetables, ask them for the science. Ask them for, show me any kind of experiment that says that vegetables are good for us. And there are zero. They won't be able to do it. So I'm going to switch gears here real quick. And this is about veganism and their mental illness. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because in 2017, I did a video on YouTube and I didn't say anything bad about veganism. And I mentioned Dr. Michael Greger. He's a vegan leader and, a, and one other person. And the vegans found me and they started to attack me and they said horrible, vile things. They made videos about me. It was absolutely disgusting. And I had to block two to three per week for a year. I blocked 300 more than 300 vegans off my YouTube channel for a year. And then two other influencers came out, Sean Baker being one of them, and uh, Frankie, another guy, he's a carnivore. And they took the brunt of their uh, vileness, of the, the vegan vileness. But I found all these studies showing how vegans have more mental illness. So here's this survey, 11 of 18 studies show greater mental illness and veganism. This one is, this is a more depression vegans, a community survey, meat avoidance creates depression, anxiety, and self-harm. I'm bringing this up because we just heard from Dr. Georgia Each. She's a psychiatrist. She uses ketosis to reverse mental illness and the consumption of red meat. And she was involved in this uh, clinical uh, trial. And this is 31 people in the office. And they had severe psychiatric problems, bipolar major depression, schizophrenia, 100% of them got better on the ketogenic diet, high fat, 75 to 80% fat, moderate protein, 15 to 20% protein, low carbohydrate, 5% carbohydrates, 43% achieved clinical remission, 96% of patients lost weight, 64% were discharged on less medication. So the ketogenic diet is what we need to calm down all of the People who are upset, anxious, depressed, bipolar, schizophrenic, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and this information and this research is pretty new. There's an, another person from Harvard named Dr. Christopher Palmer. He's fantastic. And again, from the day of this recording, about seven days ago, he was on the Today Show, the morning show, and they featured one of his patients who was a college kid and he was very um, bipolar, and he wasn't doing well. And he was sleeping by the dumpsters outside like he was homeless, but yet he was in college. His dad owns a company called Roblox, which is a video game for kids. And I'm sure he's got plenty of money, plenty of wealth and resources. They went to see over 40 doctors. Um, he took 29 different medications. They all failed. And then he finally got to see Dr. Christopher Palmer, who put him on a ketogenic diet, and now he's back to normal. So there is great hope with severe and even mild uh, psychiatric uh, depression, mental anxiety, et cetera, et cetera, by eating meat and getting off of the sugar foods. You know, burning sugar in your body is very inefficient. It's very toxic. There's a lot of waste products. And instead, if you're burning fat, you're in ketosis, you're eating meat. Um, your body gets to be able to calm down. Inflammation goes down. I have an amazing, fantastic slide about that coming up towards the end here. These are hazard ratios for heart disease. So remember, anything above one could potentially 
be a problem regarding heart disease. At the very top, we have 10.2, and that's type 2 diabetes. That is the biggest offender for heart disease. If you're a diabetic, you got to fix that up, get off the junk food, get into ketosis. I have more slides on that. Insulin resistance is at 6.4. It's the same thing. Diabetes, insulin resistance, same mechanism. And then we have infections, past pneumonia or sepsis. 6.33 in your first year post-infection. I did a bunch of videos in October, November of 2023 talking about how LDL cholesterol is for your immune system and infections raise your LDL cholesterol. And there's a lot of people with infections or LDL goes up, they go to cardiologists and they get put on statin drugs when they're not being treated for their infection. They're not being treated for their type 2 diabetes and using ketosis, they just get put on a statin drug, which is total malpractice. Metabolic syndrome is at 6.0. Again, that's just the same mechanism as type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. Here we have high CRP plus total cholesterol. CRP stands for inflammation. High blood pressure, that's a problem. Obesity, that's a problem. Those are in the fours. Cigarettes are 3.9, so that's above three, you know. And then at the very bottom, we have LDL cholesterol. This is what all the cardiologists are all, you know, ranting and raving about. Everybody's got to get their LDL down. Well, the hazard ratio for LDL is only 1.3. It's not even significant when you look at these surveys. And you can pause and read the rest. Here's ApoB. That's another very inflammatory marker. Um, but it's got to be um, oxidized. So what oxidizes ApoB? Sugar, seed oils and infection. So ApoB by itself is not a problem, but once you oxidize it with sugar, junk food, seed oils, junk food, and, and uh, deep fried food, and infection, now you have a problem. Okay, I have four slides right here coming up on examples of bad science or reading science incorrectly. So a relative risk of 1.31 is too small to be considered a problem, but yet people will say 31% increased risk of whatever disease, right? It's a total fabrication. Now, if someone says one more serving of whatever vegetable per day decreases risk of disease by 50%, know that this is implausible. And another consideration is that the studies are too small. Small studies show big effects on the human body. Large studies show lesser and lesser effects as the studies get bigger and bigger. More examples of bad science or misreading science. Any study that shows a link, association, or correlation is an observational study. And yet they say this in the news all the time. They'll say there's a link between whatever and cancer. And they're really good at saying that. There's an association, there's a correlation between name a chemical or name a food and then a disease. When you hear those words, know that it's not a trial. It's not an experiment. And you can dismiss that, and you can wait for the experiments. Absolute risk versus relative risk. And this is used all the time, and it's such an abuse. So if you have 100 people on this side and 100 people on this side, these people get a therapy to prevent a disease, okay? And then of this group, one person gets that disease. In the control group, they don't get the therapy. And two people of 100 get that disease. The absolute risk is 1 in 100 versus 2 in 100. That's the absolute risk. That's reality. The relative risk is 100%. Because one person got it in this group, two people got it in this group. This is a 100% increase over the other group. And this is what the pharmaceutical ads say all the time, or they'll say this in the news, that the risk of getting a disease without the therapy is 100% greater, but they did not tell you relative risk. And that's total BS. I've seen this for decades, and it misleads everybody. Here's another example of bad science or misreading science. One more serving of tea or six almonds a day will half the burden of cancer. That is implausible. Okay, next slide. Exercise reduce your risk of X cancer by 30%. That is not plausible. This should say people who take care of their health have less cancer by 30%. They exercise and they do other healthy things. 
You cannot connect A to B or even B to A causation from the first statement. Here's the Dean Ornish trial. There's too many variables in a lot of these surveys. So in the Dean Ornish diet, they went low fat vegan weekly counseling exercise, but yet more people died in the experimental group, but it was still deemed a success. And he built an empire, financial empire on this one study. And it was published like three or four times. And it's not a thing. The control group was so small. The number of people said he was so small. And it gets rehashed over and over again for decades. Okay, in other studies, there's not given enough time. For example, the keto diet experiments need to be at least four to six weeks just to get them into ketosis. And yet they might not be fat adapted until six or eight weeks out or even three months out to be fat adapted. So your body could be making ketones, but it's not burning the ketones yet. Fat adaptation means that your body's using the ketones for energy. Okay, another example of bad science is incorrect dose. There are science where they say 200 grams of carbs a day is a low-carb diet. There's no way that is not low-carb. The average American's at 350 grams of carbs a day down to 250 grams of carbs a day. So if you bring that down to 200, it's still very high-carb. Another example is that 30% of calories uh, coming from fat is high fat. Absolutely not. 60% of calories is high fat. So a ketogenic diet has to be 60% calories in most cases. So there's a mislabeling of the diet ratios and percentages in, in many studies. Okay, let's talk about this study right here. 2008 by Forsyth et al. published in Lipids. And one of the researchers here is Dr. Steve Finney, which I'll talk about soon also. These are seven inflammatory markers studied on a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. That's what this says in red. That's ketosis. And then the low fat diet is blue. Notice that these red ones drop tremendously. The ketogenic diet is very anti-inflammatory. Nothing beats it. Nobody's ever tried to debunk this study. It's been forgotten. And there were seven other inflammatory markers also studied, and there's no difference between low-fat versus low-carb keto with the other seven, so they're not in this graphic. Now, there's this thing called p-value, and that's the possibility value. Like, how true is this? And the number should be, let's say, 0.5 or less. Well, the p-value on this is 10 to the minus 16. This is baked into our DNA. If you want to reduce your inflammation, go on the ketogenic diet. Nothing beats it. There is no, no other diet, Mediterranean diet, low fat, you know, vegetarian, vegan, whatever. Nothing beats a ketogenic diet. If you want to reduce your inflammation and reduce your pain and get better, the ketogenic diet, 10 to the minus 16 p-value. Beat that. This is also the same study, and they measured other factors related to metabolic syndrome, and that's boxed in the green. But let's start all the way to the left. We have body mass. Red is a low-carb diet. Blue is a low-fat diet. Body mass dropped more with a low-carb diet. Here's the abdominal fat, better with low-carb. Triglycerides dropped by more than double over low-fat. And here we have HDL going sky-high compared to the low-fat diet. It actually got worse on the low-fat diet. And then we have able B, very inflammatory if it's oxidized by junk food, drop better with the low-carb diet. Here we have glucose, much better with low-carb diet. Insulin, insulin resistance, much better with the low-carb diet. And here we have in the orange box, total saturated fatty acids, much better with the low-carb diet. Why is this in orange? Here's why. It's very special. When people advocate for a low-fat diet, they say that when you eat saturated fat, it raises fat in your blood. That is not true because in the low-carb diet, they're eating more saturated fat, but yet they're burning fat. That's what makes this special. It drops the saturated fat in your blood better because you're burning fat. So you eat fat, you burn fat, but you got to get in ketosis, avoid the bread, avoid the carbs, you know, avoid the sugar. You know, don't have too much fruit. You got to keep your, your numbers correct. Now, people say, oh, the low-carb ketogenic diet is too hard to follow. I could never get my mom to do it. Well, the Verda Health Study, which is 
which is here, was two years long. 74% of the people stayed on board for two full years. If that number were 50%, that would be phenomenal. A lot of studies wish and pray they can get up to 50% participation for the full duration of the trial. But So therefore, the ketogenic diet, very satisfying, uh, very uh, healing, reversing diabetes, it dropped their A1C over the course of two years by 0.9. Notice that it bumped up a little bit here after the first year. And I think there's reasons why that I can go, you know, I, I think that they need to cycle in and out of ketosis. And there's other reasons why. But the point is, all these people stayed in ketosis for two full years. Your body will kick you out of ketosis if you don't do it on your own. It'll kick you out beginning sometime after one year. Um, I've seen it kick people out after three years of constant ketogenic diet. So you have to start controlling that by eating some fruit sometimes to come out of ketosis, measure your blood or your urine and make sure you're out of ketosis, then jump back in. It becomes very healthy when you cycle in and out of ketosis. But anyways, compare this with the vegan diet. Right here, Dr. Neil Bernard, he's a vegan medical doctor. He did a year and a half a clinical trial with diabetics, and their A1C only dropped 0 0.4. Now, I've seen vegans quote this study before, but they stop at 22 weeks. So they don't give you the full story, and they say, oh, look, veganism dropped the A1C from 8 all the way down to 7.2, which is a pretty good number, but then it climbs right back up. So it only dropped at 0 0.4 in the end. So ketosis beats veganism for diabetes. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here to the blue zones being debunked. There are five locations around the world where people live longer, and the vegans have claimed that they live longer because they don't eat meat. And there are some books that came out from a guy named Dan Butner, 2008, on the blue zones. And this was when YouTube was still new. YouTube was invented in 2006. So you can just jump on YouTube and see if his books were true or not, but you can now. And so people go to these different locations, and they experience the lifestyle and the food and the people. And they say, what's going on? These are not, um, they're not eating the diet that the vegans say that they're eating. Well, the truth is, we're going to debunk every single one of these. So let's talk about this first one, Okinawa. The word actually means land of the pig eaters. This is an island off of Japan. And in April of 1945, there's this horrible battle fought there between the Americans and the Japanese. Well, before the battle was fought, the Japanese government declared that all the pigs need to be killed off the island. So that's what the government did. They killed all the pigs. Now, the first surveys on these Okinawans was in 1949. And they came in and said, oh, look, Okinawans don't eat any meat. Well, it's because they got killed in, you know, four years earlier. That's the problem. So... In 1949, the Okinawans that survived the war, they didn't have pigs to eat, but they had eaten them all their life. Icaria, Greece is the next place. And there's a nutritionist by the name of Mary Ruddick who was there. She says they eat meat, they eat dairy, they eat eggs, and they have a lot of pension fraud. What does that mean? So if you have a guy in your house, let's say your grandfather is 85 years old in your house, he's getting a pension from the government every month and then he dies, what they're, what they're finding out is that the families do not tell the government that he died. So they keep receiving checks in the mail once a month for the next 20 years. Now the government thinks that he's 105 years old. So therefore, it's a land where people live to be older. Well, no, it's pension fraud. That's the problem. Another one is Sardinia, Italy. And there's this group on YouTube called the Yes Theory. It's a group of guys they go around the world and they visit interesting places and they talk to interesting people. Well, they went to Sardinia to experience their food and they were fed fried lard right off the bat. And they said, wait, wait a minute. I thought we we're going to be eating vegetables. And then they had a party in the town center and they brought out these big pork ribs. So no, Sardinia is not a vegan place. Nicoya, Costa Rica is another place. And I made this video about these um, blue zones and somebody made a comment. He's local to the area in Costa Rica. He says, the people in Nicoya 
they probably eat more animal fat than the average Costa Rican. They eat processed food and die of kidney disease. Loma Linda, California. This is a group of religious people called the Seventh-day Adventists. And they live longer. They have healthy lifestyles. But when you control for cigarettes, alcohol, and other bad habits, the plant-based live as long as the meat eaters. Hong Kong has the longest lived people in the whole world. And they eat the most meat in the whole world. So you can't say that meat makes you die early when the people that eat the most meat live the longest. I said this once in a video on TikTok, and I was talking to a weight loss surgeon named Dr. Terry Simpson, and he's saying that if you eat too much meat, it'll kill you. And I said, well, what about in Hong Kong when they eat the most meat and they live the longest? And his response was, well, they also eat beans and lentils. I was like, no, stop it. Stop with the BS. That's not how it goes. Let's look at some graphs. Food consumption in the U.S. from 1970 to 2014, so we're talking, you know, coming up on 40, 50 years, obesity and diabetes has gone up like this. Plant food consumption has gone up, and the red line is animal foods has gone down. We are already on a plant-based diet across the Western world. The greatest source of protein is wheat worldwide. The second great, greatest source of protein is rice. And the third is corn. Those are the three greatest sources of protein, are plants. We're on a plant-based diet worldwide. Here's the availability of red meat over the course of 50 years, how it's gone down like this, but yet diabetes has gone up. And I see it about once a year, some news story where they say, oh, red meat causes diabetes. Or you got some vegan saying, the saturated fat from red meat plugs up your cell membranes and then you get insulin resistance. Totally not plausible. It is mathematically impossible when you look at these kinds of graphs. Americans have followed the U.S. dietary guidelines. This is from Nina Teicholz. Her book is a big fat surprise. Red meat is down 28% in 50 years. All animal products are down except for chicken. Seed oils are up 87%. Grains and fruit and vegetables are all up. I'm going to talk about meat being a health food. I have some examples of this. So meat is food, plants are medicine, and drugs are poison. I'm not anti-plant. I sell a lot of herbs in my office. That's medicine. All the phytochemicals and the polyphenols and the astaxanthins, et cetera, et cetera, all these fancy biochemical terms and names, that's not food. That's medicine. The less food you eat, meaning the less meat you eat, the more medicine you need. So if you're eating a ton of plants because you feel like you have to, maybe it's because you're not eating enough food. Drugs are poison. That's the last stage of medicine. Is not, Poison is not something you run to go get. You have to eat more food, take some medicine, and if those fail, then you go get the poison. 35 eggs per day for severe burns. That is this published study right here. It's a therapy when somebody gets a severe burn. Eat a ton of eggs. Eat as many eggs as you possibly can every day. The famous healers of the 1900s all used raw animal foods to cure disease. Dr. Mayo, the Mayo Clinic, raw milk. That's how he got famous. Dr. Gerson, raw, never frozen liver, three glasses per day. Now the Gerson Clinic, they just do vegan juices. But when Ver Gerson was alive prior to 1959, all those cancer patients and tuberculosis patients, they all consumed three glasses of liver per day in the afternoon. The rest of the day was vegan uh, juices. Dr. Weston A. Price, cod liver oil combined with June butter. June butter means the cows are eating grass that's growing in June, so the grass is growing fast and it's green. It made their butter orange. These are all raw and or fermented foods, animal foods that reverse disease. A Junus von der Planitz, he's not a doctor, and he was traveling in the 1990s giving lectures. He's got some lectures on YouTube. He had a, he called his diet the primal diet, raw fermented meat and organs. He had a woman call him up on a Friday and said, I'm supposed to die this weekend. I have emphysema. What do I do? And he said, eat as many eggs as you possibly can every single day, raw. So she called him back on Monday and said, okay, I did what you told me to do. I didn't die. What do I do next? He said, wait a minute, what did you do? 
she said I ate like 30 to 40 eggs per day all day Saturday and Sunday and I didn't die I had a patient with pancreatic cancer she had one big tumor in her pancreas five in her liver that was metastasis her cancer marker in her blood was CA 19-9 her score was 10,400 the goal is zero I told her eat some food I don't care if it's raw eggs raw liver raw butter I don't care what it is pick it and eat it eat as much as you can so she ate raw liver chopped liver and she had red meat and those were her two foods every day for weeks and months her ca19-9 dropped down to 195 in three months all of her tumors were getting smaller one was gone and then she got a needle stuck into her arm this is in the summer of 2022 when that needle was very popular. I'm not going to name a disease. And she died within three months. All of her family agreed that it was the needle that caused that. And it's called turbo cancer. You may have heard of that before. Let's talk about more. Let's talk more about diets. 84% of vegetarians slash vegans abandon their diet. It's a very difficult diet. It is totally not natural to eat that many plants. And it's not satisfying. It's very difficult to do. Um, I have 21 studies showing that linoleic acid slash seed oils destroys human tissue. There's a ton of doctors on social media saying that canola oil is fine. You can fry with it. Sesame seed oil, etc. They say that these processed seed oils don't cause heart disease. They lower inflammation. But what I'm saying is that I have these 21 studies showing that they destroy human tissue. And you can destroy human tissue and at the same time, not raise inflammation. And at the same time, you can lower your LDL. It doesn't mean that it's healthy for you. As an example of that is strychnine. That's a poison and you can take it and it does not raise inflammation. I did a video on YouTube showing 44 studies showing the LDLs for the immune system. And this is something nobody talks about. LDL fuels the immune system. LDL is antimicrobial, antiparasitic. It's a, it absorbs bacterial endotoxins. Nobody talks about this. If you just plug in this idea that LDL is for the immune system, it answers all types of questions. You can win any debate. When somebody says, oh, LDL is high, therefore it's bad. So wait a minute. There's got to be an infection there. Maybe it's cancer. People that have high LDL and cancer, they, they do better than people with low LDL and cancer. You want a strong immune system. And sometimes that means your LDL goes up. It doesn't mean that you're getting heart disease. Tissue healing requires LDL for energy. And the very last word on the slide says opsonin. That's a fancy word that means the LDL prepares an organism to be consumed by the white blood cells. It prepares a meal for one. When you look up opsonin and you go to the Greek or Latin etymology of the word or the origin of the word, it means preparing a meal for one. Let's talk about agriculture. So we have a worldwide protein deficient diet. Now, if you talk about crude protein, then 40% of Americans don't get enough protein. But when you isolate the amino acids, it changes the conversation dramatically. 0% of the developing countries worldwide get enough lysine, 0%. So we're talking a lot of the world they're deficient in amino acids. Now, in nutrition conversation, we break fat up into different categories. Polyunsaturated, saturated, omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, different names for the different um, essential fatty acids versus other fatty acids. So there's different names and more science on fats, whereas in protein, we just talk about protein. We just talk about crude protein. Now, the way they determine crude protein quantities is by measuring nitrogen. But there's a variety of chemicals in our body that has nitrogen, but it's not protein. For example, urea. So in our urine, there's nitrogen. It doesn't mean that that's protein. So if you just have, talk about crude protein, or you're looking at grams of protein on a can of kidney beans versus red meat, those, those are absolutely not the same. There's this thing called diast, digestible, indispensable amino acid score, and it breaks down protein after you've consumed it, how much are you absorbing? 
how much are you utilizing? So if you have five grams of protein from red beans versus five grams of protein from meat, huge difference. The, the bean score might be 23, whereas the red meat score might be 123. It goes up between zero to 140. So meat is consistently above 100. And if you process it by heating it up, it gets better. Whereas when you process beans or lentils, it gets worse. The diet score gets worse. So if, if somebody says that red kidney beans versus red meat has the same quantity of protein, totally not true. Not true at all. Okay, a little bit more about agriculture. According to the USDA, land use for agriculture is carbon neutral in the U.S. today. So I've seen people on social media say agriculture is causing global warming, carbon emissions, blah, blah, blah. But when you go to the government who's in charge of all this stuff, they say, no, agriculture is carbon neutral. It's not even an argument. As a matter of fact, emissions from wildlife savanna versus regenerative mixed tree grassland is equivalent. So if you, if you have good regenerative farming ground and you have ruminant animals recycling the grasses, it's the same as having wildlife savanna to the environment. Grassland must be grazed or burned or it turns to desert. This is key when you have tall grasses and they die and they fall over, that's sitting on the ground, you're gonna have a lesser chance of new grasses growing through the dead grass. That grass turns the soil more acidic. You have to burn it or have ruminant animals come through and, and eat that up. Okay, in order to wrap this up, I got three slides. We're gonna talk about notes on carnivore eating. Our native diet is obligate carnivore. I learned this from Dr. Anthony Chaffee. All vegans agree because they take B12 and other supplements to replenish nutrition that's lacking because they're not eating meat. Everybody agrees that we are obligate carnivores. We have to eat meat. Even the vegans agree because of their actions. They take B12. Our native metabolic state is fasted and in ketosis. Our most nutritious foods are in this order. Liver, red meat, then white meat. Eat pounds of meat a day, not ounces. Our primary digestive hormone is glucagon, not insulin. Insulin is for emergencies, and you're supposed to use insulin sometimes when you've come upon fruit. Glucagon is our main digestive hormone. Nobody talks about this. There's no pre, post workout foods. There's no snacking, just meals followed by hours of fasting. And those meals have to be awesome. This I grabbed from Dr. Paul Saladino, nutrients critical for optimal health found only in appreciable quantities, bioavailable forms in animal foods. You can take a screenshot of that. Thank you, Dr. Saladino. I got two more slides, bear with me, we're almost done. Your diet is a daily experiment for the rest of your life. Pay attention to what your body's telling you. Meat is food, plants are medicine, drugs are poison, I mentioned that. This is how food is your medicine. This is how food is your medicine. Pay attention to what your body needs, what it's calling for, what's your appetite like. Uh, plants are medicine, for example, fiber. Not everybody needs fiber. Maybe your microbiome does, maybe you need that for constipation. Not everybody needs it. Maybe you need to avoid fiber because you have Crohn's disease or irritable bowel syndrome. Ruminant meat is the only food that people can survive on as a single food without supplementing anything else. We were apex predators for 2 million years. 14 archeological sites were carnivore. Two sites were mixed. One was carnivore slash plant. This is my last slide. All these things I talked about, that's diet. That's step one of seven steps to improving your health. Step two and three have to do with improving the function of your organs and your cells. Steps four, five, six, and seven are cleaning your body out. Clean your intestines of parasites and garbage. Clean your body out from other organisms from head to toe. Step six is getting chemicals and metals out and, and radiation. Step seven is Lyme organisms. These are organisms that live inside your cells. They need to come out. You clean your body out in steps four, five, six, and seven. You prepare your body with steps two and three, and then you, your diet is step one. People change their diet and they think that's going to cure their body. They're, it's going to cure their problem. But if you have Lyme, Candida, mold, metals, chemicals, parasites, you got to do other things to get the bad stuff out. You set the foundation with step one, but don't think that your diet alone is going to help you out. I do have patients who work on their diet 
and that's 95% of their care. I have other people, their diet is awesome, and 95% of their care is with the supplements to clean their body out. So where do you stand? Don't be surprised if you change your diet from one thing to, you can go vegan, go carnivore, keto, everything in between, and you're still sick. It's because you need to clean your body out. Maybe your house has mold. Maybe you're getting exposed to chemicals at work all the time, something like that. So there's more to it than just diet, way more to it than just diet. The last step is optimization. This has to do with supplements that can nourish your specific organs. And that's a whole science right there going back a hundred years. So there's a lot more to improving your health naturally than just changing your diet and just taking vitamin C and D. There's way more to it. If you need help with your health, you can contact my office. I'm available. I have four other nutrition practitioners. We can help you out. Just contact the office. I'll put the phone number right here.